sometimes you just expect that bad news is part of the routine of life. Isn't that the case? You just think that bad news is just one of those things. It happens. Right? But the Bible says the righteous has no fear of bad news. So you should have no fear of bad news. Amen? And that's why I tell you every week, no evil shall befall you. And then, because of that, you should have no fear of evil. Hallelujah. You know, David said, Though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. <laughs> he said, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. If David can say that, you can say better. Say, no evil shall come near me. I thought you would say that clearer. Hallelujah. And I've said it many times over and over again. And I hope you will not fall my hand now. <laughs> I have said it over and over again. The work of God is going on in my life. What about you? I did not hear you. I'm saying it for myself. The work of God is going on in my life. Are you that confident? I believe that the work of God is going on in my life. What about you? You are tired. I can say for myself, the work of God is going on in my life. Ah, okay. So, because the question is, what is the work of God that is going on in your life? See, I don't really have to know everything that God, God is doing in my life. You see? And it's unfortunate that nowadays we read what God is doing from how much money you have in your bank account, the job that you are doing that is rolling in every now and then, and then you are able to do things, stuff. You are able to buy a car. No, 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 no. God, the Bible tells us God grieves us all things richly to enjoy. We thank God for that. But that is not the work of God in your life. Do you understand? The work of God in your life is spiritual. Amen. Amen. So say it again. The work of God is going on in my life. Oh. Hallelujah. All right. These past few weeks, uh, I've been talking about pray without ceasing. Or praying without ceasing, whatever. Uh, and um, I took you through this also in our last session, last Sunday. And I'm going to pick up from where we left off. Okay? Uh, we're going to pick up from where we left off. You know, I told you that, you see, one fundamental activity that you will see consistently in the church from the ascension of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was prayer. Or is prayer. From the moment they left the Mount Olive, back to Jerusalem, the Bible says they went into a place they called Upper Room. And what did they do there? They began to pray. And in fact, if you read Acts chapter 1, the Bible says even Mary, the mother of Jesus, was with them. What were they doing together? Praying. And then, in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, the Bible says they were together what were they doing there? Praying. The day of Pentecost. Of course, after this lesson, in another lesson, I'm going to come and show you the kind of experiences we can have in prayer. When we really put our heart to prayer. I'm not going to do it now, but later I will show you. The kind of experiences we can have when we pray. You see that now? But just to open your heart to what God can do when you pray. So we see them devoted to prayer. By the time you get to, got to Acts chapter 6, the Bible says there was some sort of schism in the church. You know, people had started murmuring against each other. The Jewish uh, believers were already, you know, uh, divided against, um, you know, against the, um, the Hellenistic ones, the ones that were Greeks, they were not Jews. You know? And then, you see, <laughs> He, he, he broke into some sort of division in the church. And the apostles called the church together. And they said, look, 
We cannot leave the word of God and serve tables. Because what caused the fight? Distribution of needs. So it's just like now, we come to church now, and I said they should share some things for the church. And then it now becomes a fight that they used to give certain people. They don't used to give some certain people. Do you understand? You imagine the kind of the kind of narrative that came out of the election in Nigeria, you know, where some group say, said they, they are treated differently in Nigeria. You see that now. Now, imagine that that happened in the church, that a group in the church says, why are we treated differently? That's why, personally, I don't like the idea of groups in the church. Because it can really, you know, because we are humans. And somehow, when, you, when we all divide ourselves into groups, we tend to begin to give room to sentiments. For instance, if you call, typically, if you call a, a women meeting, if you call women meeting, what do you expect to hear there? What do you expect to hear there? You hear marriage. Majorly, it's just marriage. Majorly. You might hear one or two other things and all that. They can tell... Home, home care and home affairs, things like that. You, this is what you hear, and it's not bad. But if that is what dominates the conversation, then it is bad. Do you understand what I, what I just said? It's not bad to talk about marriage in a women's meeting, home affairs in a women's meeting. But if that is all that you discuss in the women's meeting, then it is bad. First and foremost, it is not an apostolic practice. Did you see they did not divide the church along gender? Right? They did not. And that's why you see that nowadays, even if you see, if you go to children's churches, you know, we, we kind of, maybe it's not consciously, of course, I believe the best of the church. It's not that people are doing these things to, you know, for a sinister motive. Maybe in some places, I don't know, but you see, the things we teach the children makes it more difficult for them to flow with the knowledge of God as they grow. You see. We teach them all the characters of the Bible minus Jesus. And who is the main character of the Bible? Jesus. So who should be the character they are studying? Jesus. If you want them to be Christocentric as they grow, that is the menu you must serve them from their childhood. If you bring children to church and you are singing in your singing, you are singing If that's the kind of song you sing for the children in church and that's the way you are raising them, what kind of future are you raising for them? Pepper them gang. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> I picked it off from somebody's mouth. <laughs> In the church of Jesus Christ. So you go to fellowships, go to Christian fellowships, and see the kind of songs they sing there. <laughs> You, you know, in a subtle way, only your ten. Well, I, I'm believing the best of them that they did not intentionally do it. What is the what is the relevance of aye in praising God? If you are thankful to God, why don't you just focus on God? You think God is really interested in the kind of enemy he delivered you from? The enemy does not matter when God is concerned. He delivers you without regard to the enemy. So I, I, I want you to be mindful. You, you see that in a way, I'm very calculated in the song that you sing. And it's deliberate. Because I want your mind to galvanize in that direction. I want you to pay attention. So, even at home, I, though I used to pepper my wife with all this, I give her serious ones now and then. 
I'll just be serving her classics. <laughs> Did you grow in that era? I will just be serving it. Meji meji. Oh man, be one you. Even select tunes. I'm telling you, I have them. <laughs> At least I have some. <laughs> Glory be to Jesus. But that is not how we raise people in the church. Our pattern is apostolic. Hallelujah. So we, you must be deliberate. Start thinking like that. The way you sing. The way you pray. There are some people, they don't know if they want to pray now. The only way they know to pray is cause people and die. That's the only way they know to pray. And, and then you, and maybe it's not your fault, obviously, because we were trained that way. We were trained that way. We were trained that way. And, and some of our songs are even very competitive. Jesu Kore Dasile, Mohe. And you, uh, you demonstrate it too. Uh, and you guys, why are you for me as if you've not, heard, you've not done it before? Jesu Kore Dasile. Oh, you do it now. Jesu Kore Dasile. Aha, you hear. Mohe, 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 Mohe. Mohe, Mofi, Sakbo, Mohe. Ire, Temi, Podju, Tiye, Lo. In the church. Against your brother. And then you know the funny thing. You will face the person. Your own brother or your sister. It, to, to be more participatory. But is it necessary? If I, want you to, if I want to get a response from you, what do I do? I repeat what I have said, right? I say, ah, I, are you here at all? I cannot hear you. I, why do I say all those things? To get your attention fully. Do you see that now? So, let's not create some sort of a... No, 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 that is not biblical. You cannot sing like that. Do you understand this? That's, just take that as some uh, early morning uh, uh, nuggets for you to charge your mind. <laughs> Don't sing like that. Okay? If you have been doing it, what should you do to it? Throw it away. Okay? We are here to worship the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You need to understand that. When the children of Israel saw an appearance of God, I did not say they saw God. They saw an appearance of God. They said to Moses, let him not speak to us again. We don't want to see him. We don't want to hear him. You go and meet him. Anything he tells you, you tell us and we will obey. Do you? I, so I want you to understand who God is. You think they were crazy? They were not. They saw something that was bigger than them. And they calmed down. You know, they, 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 they are the ones that used to harass, they used to harass Moses. For everything, they are harassing him. For everything, they are harassing him. They saw God. God came down. And they, they only saw an appearance. And they, were, they, calm, they calmed down. And from that moment, they didn't want to see God again. They said, God, talk to Moses. Don't worry. We are okay talking to human beings. We just want to talk to human beings. We don't want to talk to God again. Anything you want to say, say it to Moses. We will listen to him. Do you see that now? So, it should tell you that when you come before God, there must be some sort of call that you carry for God. Are you following me? There's that hall that you carry for his presence. Do you see that now? There's that hall. So we sing it, God is awesome, but we don't really treat him as awesome. If he is awesome, there is a decorum that the presence of God commands. And it will affect the kind of things you say when you come. 
you know you will not come and say uh, in the presence anything goes so i can't do like this you'll not be doing all sort of funny funny behavior exhibiting all sort of like like your head has gone nuts no that's not in the church there is decorum in the church And I'm not saying you cannot praise God. I'm just saying in praising God, mind your language. Do you understand? Mind your language. Hallelujah. All right. Pray without ceasing. I want to hear you again. The work of God is going on in my life. Oh, say it loudly. The work of God is going on in my life. Hallelujah. All right. So pray without ceasing. Let's go on. So I said, the apostles told them in Acts chapter 6, we will not leave the word of God and serve tables. Why? We cannot leave important spiritual matters. To focus on temporary matters or temporal matters. We cannot leave spiritual things and focus on things of this life. So imagine some people will say they don't have clothes. That's why they did not go to church. You know, it's a lie if you say you don't have clothes. Eh? You just don't have what you think you desire. Uh, is that very clear? Uh-huh. Um, uh, you know that we know that is not a rule in this place. Even me, I am as ca- I am as everyday as possible. So there is no point trying. To, there, there is nobody you are trying to impress, right? Just look neat, right? Ne- look neat and presentable before God. You know there is no dress code that you should, you should come to church with. There's no dress code. I saw, I think it's Reverend Olumide Emmanuel. I saw a video some time ago. And he said, they, you know, this group of pastors, I don't know under what platform, but he said this group of pastors, they were praying for um, Nigeria. And they were praying for economic prosperity. They were praying for peace and you know, whatever. They were praying for all sorts for Nigeria. And as they were praying, and they were praying that, you know, Nigeria should grow, businesses should boom and all that. And he said, as they were praying, he said, you know, I, I don't know if he said God spoke to him or he, he, he considered it, that look, the suit he was wearing was imported. And he said at that time, he had at least about 100. I, I hope, I'm, I, I hope I'm, I'm recollecting the details correctly. He said at that time, he had about 100 of them imported and you are praying that the country should grow but you cannot wear local stuff and then you know even if people want to give you gifts they want to take pride in giving you imported stuff and then you will go to church and be praying that God should turn around your economy but you do you despise local things you know these are the kind of things we don't understand in the church world and we need to come back home. So this idea of church wears and then you now even pick foreign wears, is, it should, it should, we, should, we should face it out. I know that some of our local fabrics too, they are, <laughs> they are, they are manufactured abroad. So, <laughs> so it can, this excuse can be silly, but, but we can start from somewhere. A friend of mine told me, Africa does not have contribution to the international personality. And it's true. It's very true. The Americans and the Europeans are dominating the world in terms of food and their clothes. They have exported it across the world. We hit their stuff everywhere. But we have not, been, we have not successfully been able to export our whole stuff to them. And even the things, our things that they use, they take, the, take it in the raw form and turn it to what they like. And then some of them, they send it back to us to buy. So, so if you just put that to the side, I, I'm just saying generally that, you know, 
you cannot use that as excuse not to come to church that you don't have clothes what happened to the one in your wardrobe because i am sure it is not empty right and if your wardrobe is not empty you cannot use that as an excuse not to come to church so imagine the apostles surrendering to or caving to because they don't want the Grecian Christians to feel ostracized in the church they now say don't worry we will see to it I will pers- like Peter says I will personally see to it that you are looked after I will make sure your needs are met and provided and then he leaves prayer meeting to go and be sorting how they share food but that was not his response what did he say we will not leave the word of God and serve tables and you should not too you should not too you know and typically people say that you know you, the attendance of a church at a prayer meeting is its actual, is its actual population a, a church is as big I mean, in terms of population, a church is as large as the attendance as it's, at its prayer meeting. If you don't attend prayer meetings, can you really say you are a member of that church? That means you are cherry picking what, you can, what activities you want to participate in. But the apostles were not like that. They said, we will not leave the word of God and serve tables. And you should not do the same. You should not leave the word of God to serve tables. Hallelujah. All right. And I did tell you also that they left, left us instructions to pray. To show you that these are the things that this, this is one principal activity they want everyone to be involved with. This is one activity they want everybody to be involved with. Romans chapter 12, verse 12. They want you to be in prayer all the time, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Can you see that? Continuing instant in prayer. Look at Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. What does it say? Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Is that very clear? That is the, that is, the, they said we should pray all the time. In First Peter chapter 4 verse 7, But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Watch unto prayer. That's what they said. And Jude verse 20. Jude has only one chapter. Jude 20. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Can you see that? Praying in the Holy Ghost. So they left us instructions to pray. And to pray all the time. So what is our duty? One of our principal duties in the church is to pray. Is to pray. And I told you, our praying should be should be with devotion excluding activities of the flesh that's what devotion means excluding activities of the flesh don't i said it is okay do you remember i said that it is okay to pray when you are doing stuff like you are doing housework and then you are praying alongside it's okay but if all of your prayer is done alongside other activity i said it what lacks devotion so you should give time and attention to prayer that is separate a moment where you are doing nothing else other than praying you are not doing housework alongside it okay this time is just between you and god you devote it to god strictly and then when, that, when you are done with that, as you go around your day, go around, you know, fulfilling the activities of your day, you can pray alongside. That is okay. But don't make your prayer all around. Don't pray only around activities. It will lack, your prayer will lack devotion. Okay? All right. Colossians, 
4 2. Colossians 4 verse 2. I read that when I was talking about the instructions of the apostles for us to pray. And then I told you also that no one is left out of praying, right? No one is left out. No one. And so everybody should participate. It's not like, you know, when we were growing up, we, I, I, and I'm sure I, I want to believe it's the same for most of us. In churches we attended growing up, they will have a prayer department. That you, if you are joining the workforce, you will have to choose to join prayer department. Now, and I told you, that's an, that's, uh, it's, now it's outdated. Everybody is included in prayer. And I said, here, yeah, everybody is going to pray. Yeah, this is not you are a, you what if you want to be warrior champion fire brigade whatever you want to be everybody is involved it is not a question of pastor is praying for us yes but you will pray too there is nothing that stops you from praying god wants you to pray so you must pay attention to prayer that's why the bible says watch unto prayer it's an instruction to you. Continue in prayer. Pray without ceasing. All these instructions are for you to pray. Do you see that now? All right. So, no one is left out from praying. And then, they also give us specific issues to pray about. Now, I want you to take a moment. I'm going to read some passages to you. And I want you to see. So, open your Bible and let's read together. Okay? Okay? So that you see the things that were the most important to God. Matthew, I'm going to read from chapter 9. Matthew, chapter 9, I'm going to read <clears throat> verse 37 and 38. Then said he unto his disciples. Are you there now? Matthew 9, verse 37 to 38. 38. Then said he unto his disciples. The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Can you say that now? What did he say you should do? Pray to the Lord of harvest. What should he do? Send laborers into his harvest. When last did you do that? <laughs> Because I led you to pray. If I did not lead you to pray, when last did you do this? But what did Jesus say? Pray. That the Lord of the harvest will send laborers. Now, do you think you will be accountable for praying this? Because it's an instruction, right? Eh? Do you see it now? You know, that, that's why, you know, you know, one of our series on Thursday, to which many of you don't come, uh, I taught you what I titled what? God's reward system. And one of the issues I highlighted was what? Prayer. That if he asks you to pray, it is because in his value system, praying ranks high. And in his reward system, praying will earn rewards. Do you see that now? So if he actually gave us specific things to pray about, you had better start praying about those things. Do you see that now? You don't need to be a pastor to pray, to pray this. As long as you are a Christian, you should pray this. You see that now? So he says, pray to the Lord of harvest to send laborers into his harvest field. Let's go on. Look at chapter 26, same book. Matthew chapter 26. I'm going to read, I'm going to read from verse, um, I'm going to read from verse 41. Look at it. Watch and, pray. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Is that very clear? This, he was talking to his apostles here because he told them to pray, to tarry with him together to pray. So he went a stone throw away from them to pray. He came back, made them sleeping. What did he say to them? Watch and pray. That he enter into, not into temptation. In fact, if you read from verse 40, what Jesus told them was Peter. He told Peter, what? 
Could ye not watch with me? Could you not watch with me one hour? So, now that you have been a Christian for some time, why is your prayer not yet an hour at least every day? In fact, Kenneth E. Hagin, the papa, you know, Kenneth E. Hagin, said, you should endeavor to give a tithe of your time every day to God. A tithe of your time. A tithe of your time. And that will include the time you spend in your quiet time to pray and stay before God and to study your Bible. It's not too much. I hope you know it's not too much. But we have just been so, you know, this culture of the world, we have been so ingrained in the culture of the world such that we are now so busy for God that we only meet God in the course of our daily activities. So, the reason, the only time you pray is when you are doing other stuff is because you have now become too busy. Now, if you are busy that you cannot pray, you are too busy. Did you hear me? If you are too busy that you cannot pray, then you are too busy. You are too busy. Or it might be that, you know, because there are some people, uh, they, they don't know how to suffer a bit of a bit, a, a, a bit of discomfort you know if you, are, if you are so busy that you know you don't have enough time maybe you should cut into your play time right? cut it, cut out of your play time cut it off and spend time, spend it praying what if your sleep time is a little too long you see, they say you should sleep eight hours. I, I'm not disputing the science. So I'm just saying, if you don't have any other time, you can cut that eight hours to six. What happens to seven? Even at a start, to start with seven hours, 30 minutes, and use 30 minutes to pray. And then as you grow in it, you begin to expand it. Then you go to one hour. But do you know that there is nothing that is that serious. Now, if somebody, if you, you have a program today that you want to attend to, if something more important comes up, you will cancel the other one. Don't you do that. So, the reason you don't pray is not because you are busy. It is because you don't care. It is because you don't care. And that's just the plain truth. And if we search ourselves deep inside, you will know what I'm telling you is correct. And that's why, you know, and it is true that, you know, the Bible says it's of the Lord's mercy we are not consumed, right? It's of the Lord's mercy and there is no doubt about it. And that's why, you see, in our, in our culture, you see that we say it a lot. It is to excuse your inefficiency in your relationship with God. You, are, you, you say that often to excuse your inefficiencies. Oh, you don't pray. To go to church, you say, ah, me that I don't pray. I don't even go to church regularly. But God is blessing me. Anonymous <laughs> Rigbao. He's of the Lord's mercy. You know, the reason you say, you say that and you are proud to say it, something you should be ashamed of. The reason you can easily say that and say it publicly is because you have no regard for God and the things that matter to Him. If morning does not work for you, what about night? Yeah, you know, I, I also believe that morning time is the best time. Best time for quiet, your quiet time. It is. But there are some people, the kind of work they do and the place they live, Lagos is hard life. So if you have to wake up 4 a.m., 5 a.m., it's hard. Okay, have you tried to shift that prayer to another time of the day? There are some people, they use their break at work. They use it compulsorily. They will not work. So what do you do with your break time? Have you gone to some government offices? At break, they will close. They will go and pray. Do you know that there are some people, they do that. 
And in some um, in some government offices they do that. And Muslims do it on Friday. Once it is that one PM or two. In fact, one they won't leave two now. They would have left around one. Because they cannot have their they cannot I I don't know how, how that works, but I don't think they observe their Jumat anywhere. They have to go to a proper mosque. Th- that is that is if. So, so, so you cannot normalize the exception. Which is what we do mostly nowadays. We want to normalize the exception. Now, like I said earlier, you are you are you have activities lined up for the day, and then you pray alongside. That's an exception. But it's okay, right? That should not now be your permanent way of praying. Do you get it now? Now, if, if they don't have a mosque nearby, what do they do? They arrange themselves into a group and they, somebody will lead them, they pray. But other than that, what do they do? They go to an actual mosque. It's devotion. So you cannot, you cannot um, just treat, you, you cannot treat spiritual things anyhow. It's not right. If morning does not work, try afternoon. Say, I'm at work. What about night? Say, I'm tired. Spare some more. Just a moment. You know, that 30 minutes of sleep that you will cut will not kill you. It's, it's a lie. You will not die. You won't. If the stress of that work does not kill you, that 30 minutes that you will cut out of sleep to pray cannot kill you. And if you give yourself any reason to believe that uh, if you don't sleep enough, you will die, you have believed a lie. Because it is the same you that left your house 4 a.m. And you did not complain. Did you see that? And many of us, when we started life, out, when we started hard life working, and that was how our life was. So. And that, that's why I always tell young people that are just coming, I'm still young too, but you know, when, when you're just coming into employment, I say, look, whatever you go through, just take it as part of life. It is one of those things. It does happen. Have you seen somebody who is just starting out life that is, that's flexing? It usually requires hard work. And your bosses will be pushing you here and there. They will be sending you here and there. In fact, you will do many other jobs. Maybe because you are the youngest in the office or you are the most junior. In some offices, if you work in the civil service, for instance, eh, there are some eggmen that will come to you. <laughs> you know? Hallelujah. But don't ever make, use all those things as excuse not to pray. In fact, the, one of the reasons, I, there was one of my former employers, one of the reasons I felt uncomfortable there was because I was losing my spiritual sense. Because they could just say, we should come to work on Saturday. That is fine, I do go. But then, we could only attend trainings on Sundays. And then you go and meet them and say, guys, okay, fine, Sunday. If there is no, they, the excuse is that there is no other day they could have put the training. And that's not true. But because they want us to come to work Monday to Friday, they will not put training during the week. Because the other, you, other units put trainings midweek. But in our own division, they will say no. We have to do our trainings weekends. And they will put it on Sunday. The annoying part, they will put it Sunday 9 a.m. Only, only Catholics among us will be able to go for early, you know, because they can do early morning mass. And then some of them too will use the excuse not to go. I cannot come and kill myself now. You know, that can, you, we all say it. Right? I cannot come and kill myself. And do you know the funny thing? The people in charge of that scheduling, they are actually Christians. <laughs> no, they are not seven day Adventists. They are Pentecostals, Charismatics. If they are seven day Adventists, I will say, ah, this is beautiful. Do you understand? You know you know how to handle that kind of stuff. If the, if the person is Seventh-day Adventist, you know that they worship on a Saturday. So maybe it doesn't count Sunday as... But since we are both Christians, I can still go to you and tell you, oh, you don't count Sunday as important. You count Saturday. Okay, but I count Sunday as important. So you should honor the day that I count as important. But they are not reasonable at all. 
and then they will insist that we should come in the morning. They are, and they never give us exception. Never. That we should do it. In, we should start the session in the afternoon. Never did they give us that opportunity. And then, you know, in my spirit, I started becoming agitated. I started becoming agitated. What sort of nonsense is this? Can you imagine you close at work and nobody will stand up to go home? <laughs> right? What kind of nonsense is this one? You will not stand up, okay? Ah, I will. Me, I don't do like that, too. Me, I get up. I take my jacket. In fact, I had to increase the volume of my computer. You know when you shut down Windows computer? It will make that sound. I increase the volume so that they will hear me. Ba, 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 ba. I take my jacket. I say, good night, everybody. I'm gone. And then my colleagues started doing the same. It's, 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 just, it's just the hard labor is to deprive you of your spiritual life. It might not be calculated and in some places it is deliberate. Why is it that it is when you are going to church that all these hard jobs start coming out? And you know, you, you, sometimes all morning you are free, doing nothing. You are just in the office, sitting down, listening to music, playing games on your computer. And then once you go and meet your boss, 3 p.m. Ah, ma, I'm closing early today. I want to leave exactly 4 o'clock when we close. Then, three, she sends you some, something to quickly, so please, quickly arrange this thing before you go. And then, you, you cannot, you, if you go, you run, you're in, you, if you go late, you run into traffic, then you don't get to church. You know, there are some bosses that you have to go and tell them that you are leaving. That, that is the kind of look they, they have so you know they have so debased the human mind human mind they, they subjugate you the, the rule book says close for four, four o'clock oh. just close and go right maybe cut see good night everyone right but there are some people they will tell you come and tell me good night you must not live without telling me Yeah, you know, I told you of a boss that said that we will not, we will not go home, we will sleep in the bank. And I said, no, I won't. It will never happen. I told her to her face, point blank. And I've never done that before to a boss. I said, no, I will not. I will not. I can, if there is work, I will work late. If, some, if there is something to do, I, and my wife knows me, if, I, if there is something to do, I will wait and do it. If, it's, if there's an opportunity to take it home, I'll, because, you know, I go, I'll take it and I'll go and do it. But that I should sleep in the workplace, even the owners of the business don't sleep overnight. And they, they, you will now put your head on the chair if you want to rest. I said, what kind, of, what kind of nonsense is that? You have been debased, don't you get it? You have been debased. Pharaoh told the children of Israel, go and pick straw by yourself. We will not give you any more. So now, they said, we have given you internet now. Look for materials. Look for resources. You have to go and look for everything to do your job by yourself. You will think you are becoming smarter. They are taking your time away from you. And every time they take from you, deprives you of time with God. But you still have to work, right? So how do you find the balance? Do you, do you see the dilemma everybody faces? Everybody is in it. And I hope when you become an employer, you will not do the same. Otherwise, we will perpetuate that cycle of evil. And we must never, ever be like that. Ever in this life be like that. As an employer, you be someone of note. Make a difference in your field. Don't be the evil that your workers will try to avoid. Do you see that now? Deliver on your own job. So, don't use all these things as excuses. They are just excuses. They are. And the reason we are all bound to one particular job is because we don't trust God. You don't see God as your source you see the employer, you see the job. See, the job is an instrument of God. And if it becomes toxic to your relationship with God, throw it away. God will provide a better one. 
we need to grow that confidence and put confidence in God, not in jobs. Because the economy can tank tomorrow. If the economy tanks, what will happen to the job? That job that you have hugged, that you don't want to release, it will walk away from you by itself. Put your trust in God, not in jobs. Put your trust in God, not in government. Put your trust in God, not in the system. You say, ah, there is a welfare system in our country. It will not go bad. Okay. Wait. We will see. Just wait. I'm not prophesying, but you will see it. It is in our very presence. You will see these things caving. Do you know, 20, uh, how many of you were not, uh, uh, you know, old enough? 2007-2008. You, uh, you read the news at that time. And you heard of the recessions, right? Um, um, uh, stock market collapse. You saw all of it, right? Uh, some of the shares I bought at that time. They are, I have the carcass in my house. We bought them 25 naira, 30 naira, 50 naira. Today, some of them, they are worth under 10 naira. We are yet to recover the losses since 2000, 2008. 2008. Do you see the wealth that has been eroded? And, it, and it's not just you. There are several other people who did the same. And their wealth has been eroded. Don't put confidence in money. The Bible says, tell those who are rich in this world not to be high-minded. That, but they should put their trust in God who gives us all things richly to enjoy. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. Put your confidence in God. Don't put your confidence in a boss. My boss is a nice boss. He's a nice boss, but doesn't give you time to go to, to, to church. Does not give you time to pray. You cannot even go home to, to your wife or your husband. And your boss is a nice boss. You are deceiving yourself. You are deceiving yourself. If somebody likes you, we give you time. Say, work life balance. Oh, you be debating you know, work life balance. What about work God balance? What about life God balance? You know, the conclusion of Solomon after considering everything, he said, This is the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Fear God. Obey his commandments. He says, This is the whole duty of man. All duty of man. Your only, see, your fidelity is to God. So when you treat men with utmost fidelity, it is because of God. Hallelujah. So never, ever, and ever again, use work as excuse, right? Never use work as excuse not to pray. Or not to do things that are holy. And are spiritual. Don't miss fellowship because of work. So once in a while it can happen. Emergencies can come up. But don't make it an habit. Hallelujah. Are you still here? Alright, Luke chapter 21. Luke 21. I'm going to read verse 36. Watch ye therefore. Luke 21, 36. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. You see that now? Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things. He's talking about the events of the end times. He says, watch and pray always. Watch and pray always. That's why the Bible says watch unto prayer. You know, your sensitivity can be dull if you don't pay attention through prayer and be sensitive to what is going on around you. You know, who was I telling recently? That, you know, you can know, you can know so much and still, know, and still know not so much. Do, do you have monopoly of knowledge? Do you know all the things that have ever happened on this earth? Do you know? Do you know what is currently going on right now across the world? No. 
you can only know the extent to which you know that you expose yourself to, right? Romans chapter 15, verse 30. We prayed with this earlier. Romans chapter 15, verse 30. So far, have you seen anything about praying something for something you need? Have you seen it? So far, not yet, okay. Romans chapter 15, verse 30. I beseech you, yes, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, uh -huh, and for the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me. 31. That I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea. Yes. My service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of sin. So this year is telling you to pray for who? Missionaries. Ministers of the gospel. Right? This is an instruction from the apostle to the church. Strive together with me. That is, he's not surrendering praying. Right? He's praying to. But he says, I want you to join me in prayers. Do you see all the time we are asked to pray, they are for spiritual things? Did you, have you noticed it? Alright. Colossians chapter 4, verse 3. This is another prayer that is demanded of us. Colossians chapter 4, verse 3. In fact, let's read it from verse 2 uh, into 3 um, for clearer context. Continuing prayer, yes. Watch in the same with thanksgiving. Verse, verse, verse 3. Without praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds. Can you see that now? Continuing prayer. Watch in the same with thanksgiving. So, what, what prayer should you be praying? It says, pray for us also. Pray for us also. That God will give us utterance. That when we stand to preach the gospel, we will be bold to speak. Can you see that? One? Speak what? He calls it the mystery of Christ. It's not just to open your mouth and say anything. It's not just to open your mouth and say anything you like. No, it's not about saying anything you like. It is about the mystery of Christ. Which the Bible says was it from the foundation of the world. And what is it? That if anyone believes in Christ, he's saved from God's wrath. He's saved from sin and death. He's saved from darkness, from the kingdom of darkness. He's brought into the kingdom of God's dear son. You see that now? That is the mystery of Christ. That's the gospel. And then it used, to be, it used to be Jews only. But a time kicked in in history where the Gentiles were brought in into the mystery of Christ. Do you see that now? So every nation, every local government, every state, every country, of every continent have access to the kingdom of God if they will believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. But you see, our duty to pray for the ministers of the gospel to have the utterance to stand, to stand in the, in the faith and preach the gospel. Hallelujah. And in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 25, it simply just says, Brethren, pray for us. You see that now? Brethren, Pray for us. That, that is talking about ministers of the gospel. We pray for ministers. So do you see how much he says we should pray for more ministers, right? He says we should pray for utterance for the ministers, right? He says we should pray, watch and pray because of the activities of the end times, right? Do you see all of that? Everywhere we were given instructions to pray. And you see all of these are spiritual activities we are told to pray about. Now, I want to show you other scriptures that are not instructions to us to pray about, but they are especially important for, the, for a Christian. And you see them in 
Paul's prayer for the church of Jesus Christ. You know, Paul prayed for his churches. And in praying for his churches, he prayed in a specific way. He, he was not asking the church to pray. But he, he, he would always tell each church the way he was praying for them. And if you look at these prayers, they, have, they hold a very significant place for us today. If we want to arrive at the same destination as the Christians of Paul's day. Now, so if we want to have the same effect, if you want the gospel to have the same effect, you know, the same way it was in the time of Paul, we need to look at the way Paul conducted himself, the gospel, and how he prayed for the churches, right? Does it make sense? So if you want to achieve the same result as the church, the first church, the early church, we need to also look at the things they did that made them pick, that made them, you know, what they were. Okay? Uh, so let's start with Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, I did not ask you memory verse. I'm coming. No? You will come and recite my memory verse. You, you, you thought you have taken, uh, you thought you had that one. You have not hidden it. Oh. Now, last week, our memory verse was what? Ephesians chapter 1. Verse, what was last week? That was the one I gave you for this week. And for oh, last week, yeah, you are correct. I gave you Ephesians 3 14 to 21. Okay, so the previous one, I gave you Ephesians 1 15 to 22. Is 23? Okay, that was what I gave you then. Okay, so now, you remember I told you that if you pay attention to that, you realize that that's actually a prayer. Okay, and I'm deliberately giving you the prayers, right? To memorize. It's deliberate. You will get the reason very soon. So go back there, Ephesians chapter 1. I know before then I gave you Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 11. Okay, so now go to Ephesians 1, verse 15. I'm going to read it to verse 23. Look at what it says. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all saints... Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. So, look at it. He's praying for his church, right? He's praying for his church. So, he says, when I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, I cease not to pray for you. You see that now? I cease not. That is, I do not stop to pray for you. So, what is he praying about? Look at verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. What does he want God to do? Give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The spirit of wisdom. That they are, they, they are wise in the revelation of God. You remember? In the previous lesson, the one before this one, when I taught you, when I spoke on receiving God's word deliberately, remember I told you what is the purpose of Scripture? To make you wise unto salvation, right? Now he says he wants God to give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in what? To know more business, to know more tech, Lord. No. It's not to know more tech. It's not to know more, uh, uh, more subjects. It's not to know, you know, physics, biology. And, no, that's not what it is for. He says he wants you to have the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Meaning that your job as a Christian is to know God. The reason you come to church is to know God. Did you hear me? The reason you come to church is to know who? To know your pastor? No. To know who? God. To know. He says to give you the spirit. Of, he's praying to God to give you a spirit of wisdom. To know him. So all the wisdom is praying to you, to God for, for you, is so that you can know God. He wants God to help you to know him. 
You see that? That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, verse 17, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him. Look at verse 18. What happens when the spirit of wisdom comes into you? It says, the highs of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Pause. In fact, let's read 19 together with it. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Wait, we are coming back to that. So he wants them to know what? The spirit of wisdom. When they not have the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God, what will happen to them? He says the highs of your understanding will open. That's what he calls enlightened. You will know something. Do you see that now? You will know. And that's why I've explained this to you before. That the highs of your understanding is, is the highs, in some translations, it, it will say your mind be flood, or your eyes be flooded with lights. It's talking about your mind, your intellect, your ability to reason. You see that now? Anytime you see understanding, knowledge, it is, your, it, is, it is referring to your mental faculties that you are able to use your mind to discern the knowledge of God. God will open your mind to his knowledge. So what he's praying to God for is that their mind should open to the knowledge of God. Do you see it now? That their mind should open to the knowledge of God. That's why every time you come here, I'm always talking about God. Do you see? I'm not telling you something else. If you want to know your physics, you better read your book. Right? If you want to know your accounting, you better read your books. Right? Read Open Frank Wood. Me, I'm an accountant. You open Frank Wood. Read it from cover to cover. You understand the elements of accounting. Abby? If somebody wants to study your kind of... Uh, if you want somebody wants to do your kind of profession, what's your primary course? Very general. Uh, but what, what, what are the primary ones? Economics. Eh? Thomas Sowell. Thomas Sowell. Okay, I see him. I see his materials. So, you see, this man too. You see now. Now... <laughs> Do, do you recall those days of Ababio and so on and so forth? Eh? Ayakoa. You see. Mathematics, Inko. Did you, did you general mathematics? Ad, additional mathematics. That's what you will read if you want to pass in school. Do you understand? In, by the time you get to the university, the text, become, the text becomes more complex. Right? Then you need to start reading research papers. Because your lecturers will give you papers to write. And when you are doing when you're writing papers, you will do literature review. Right? And then you begin to cite scholars. And if you don't read the work of scholars, you will score zero. Right? <laughs> so if you want to be vast in the things of this world, you will need to go to school. But if you want to be vast in the things of God, what will you study? The Bible. Where will you study it? In church. Do you see that now? In church. In church. So the knowledge of God, I'm coming, the, the knowledge of God is the principal thing in the assembly of Christians. So he says, he prayed to God to have their mind enlightened. So he wants them, so when their mind is enlightened, three things he listed. He says they will know the hope of his calling. Do you see that? Did you see that in your Bible? Hope of his calling, right? Then they will see what? Eh? The glorious inheritance of the saints, right? And then the third thing, the exceeding greatness of his power. So in church, you know nowadays, you hardly go to church and have this sense of Jesus is coming. When last did you hear it? Okay, now it's a, a bit more... Uh, since, I think since COVID-19, it gained a little bit prominence in church. 
In fact, some of the first banners I saw after COVID-19, I saw marriage. I saw uh, fix your marriage. All sorts of things. I say, these people don't learn. <laughs> they don't learn. Because after, after being locked down for months at home with your wife, we could not go to church. You open church, the first thing you talk about is marriage. These people don't learn. They don't learn. They don't learn. And do you know that period of lockdown? You know, if you don't know how to relate with your wife, you are taught by force. <laughs> Did your husband go anywhere? Did he go anywhere? And sometimes it can be Larica. But that particular period, he stayed with you. Did you enjoy the, his company? You see? You know, all those husbands that used to now claim that they, are, they, are, they have evening meeting and they will go and hang out with their friends at the beer parlor and they will come and love you know, they did not have a choice. They stayed at home. Because, you know, bars were one of the places they shut down. <laughs> so they could not flex around. So if you had a wife, what do you do? Stay with your wife. Lesson 101 in marriage. Stay with your wife. Stay with your wife. And of course, those who did not know how to do things, eh, that was the period their marriage actually hit the rock. So what happened to all the marriage seminars and all the lectures, counseling they've been attending? See, and I always tell you, maybe not all of you, but I always say that there are two things that are important in marriage. Only two things. Listen to me. There are only two things that are important in marriage. You see, every other thing that you have learned, that they have taught, 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 taught you, they are not bad, necessarily. Okay? As long as they are consistent with scripture. But that is not what God wants you to know about marriage. What God wants you to know about marriage is two. Two things. Or there are two. Two things. One for the man. One for the woman. Husbands, love your wife. As Christ loved the church. And gave himself for it. That is the husband's own. And notice, husband, love your wife. Pause. How should he love his wife? As Christ loves the church. How did Christ love the church? He demonstrated it by giving himself for it. That shows you that the love of Christ for his church is unconditional and it is limitless. Every man should so love his wife. If you understand that, if you know you will not stay with your wife, you will not marry. Period. Number two. Wives, submit to your husband as unto the Lord. So when you look at your husband, who are you seeing? Jesus Christ. So when you see him as your Lord, you will submit. Oh, Nick Pelolori Eja. Oju <laughs> You are talking to your husband, though. You are playing. Okay, you are playing with Jesus too. You now give your. You know, you want to call your husband. You now call him all the bad names in the world. No, he says submit you to your husband as unto the Lord. If you see. Stop correcting your husband to do something. You do yours. Face your own lane and do yours. And then your husband too should face his own lane and do his. If everyone does their job, every marriage will be blissful. Because in love you will tolerate. Right? You will correct too. Sometimes correction can be, but... Even in correcting, you will tolerate, right? Eh? Can you imagine? Some people will say a couple, they were fighting, they fought over toothpaste. Because somebody pressed toothpaste from the bottom, and that one pressed it from the middle. So, and so what? Because of that now, the, wife, the husband now slapped the wife. The wife now said, eh, eh, you slapped me, you will kill me today. Ah, <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, you now you now locked him. You will kill me today. Ah, he will beat you. Even if the authorities will deal with him later, he would have beaten you. What if you die? What if you die? Even if you, even if they served him justice, you would have died. You see that now. So he says, three things are important when you have enlightenment of God. You have the hope of His calling. Your hope will not be in this world anymore. Your hope will not be in your job. It will not be in that boss because the boss is kind. People change. What if it changes tomorrow? Your hope will not be in your boss. Your hope will not be in the economic system of this world because it can collapse tomorrow. Your hope will not be in money because money will grow wings and fly away. Actually, the Bible says riches grow wings, not money. Riches grow wings and fly away. He said, hey, me, I don't have money. I have precious materials. I have gold. I have, oh, okay. 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 Don't forget, for part of the history, we, they used to use gold. How did it fade out? Something retired it, right? So, don't put confidence in anything. Put your hope in Christ. The Bible says Christ is our hope of glory. So that's why you come here. You are always hearing of Jesus every time. Because that is the only hope that we have in this world. The song we sang this morning says what? Christ is our hope in life and in death. I'm deliberately making you sing that way because I want you to, I want to change your consciousness. I want to change what you are devoted to. To see only Christ so that your focus will only be on him. The Bible says if your eyes be, fo if, if, you, if your focus is single, if your eyes be single, it says your whole body will be full of light. You cannot be looking at two things at the same time. Can you look at two things at the same time? You will lose focus. Or can you use your two eyes to look at two objects at the same time? Use the right one to look at Dimeji and use your left one to look at me. Oh yeah, let's try. Bishop Oedepo said it. God told him, son, use one eye to look down and use the other one to look up. He said, the day you look to any man, you, foc you take your focus away from me. Where do you want to have your own focus? Economic system? Monetary system? Trade? Commerce? Business? You know, you, you say, ah, me, I have arrived though. I'm living in Ikoyi. Flood will come and wash the house away. It is a question of time. You, say, you go and build beach house. Tsunami can come one day and you will not sleep in that house again. In fact, you will not be able to go there because it would have become shadow of itself. So before the world we make things become shadow, you make them shadow in the light of Christ. Do you understand what I just said? You make it a duty. Turn all of them to shadows in the light of Christ. Let them not matter. Let the amount you have in your bank account, let it not freak you. Your babe is a happening babe. Let it not freak you. The Bible says beauty is fleeting. You don't know. God only has praise for the daughters of Zion. Whose beauty is of a, is inward. A, cont a contrite and a quiet spirit. Not with braided hair and apparel. Bling, bling. Bling, 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 bling gang. Tomati wale ba iluti daruni eh, you see, they enter like this everywhere scatter. Or every boy will be looking. Every boy, they take attention away from everything to themselves. Beauty is fleeting. Beauty fades. You know when you now become sixty years old. Kote ni la ti de sixty months. You know men can still do fine boy at sixty, seventy. There are some of them still trying to do fine boy, but women. You can try hard. Make up. <laughs> oh, you don't understand. It is make up. 
you will now be painting your face. When you want to go out, you will start one hour ahead so that you can paint your face. That's the way it works. The wrinkle will come. You don't know. Even men, wrinkles will catch up. It's a question of time. So beauty is fleeting. You know, it's just a way you're te- telling teenagers. Ha, ah, don't follow boys. Don't follow boys. Oh, Nick, but they will not listen to you. The, it is the boy they want to follow until they become pregnant. That accord they are now doing will now disappear. And now that you, you are pregnant, your shakara is over. Are you following what I'm saying? Your shakara is over. Boys will not consider you happening baby again. Your time has passed. They will now you just say mother, uh, single mother. That's what they will be calling you now. Eh? Eh? And you're bad. You're bad. You're bad. I can, you know, call it Adelebo. It's very bad. That's a very bad name to call somebody. So everything is fleeting. Retire everything before they retire you. You make the choice to retire things and focus on Jesus. Let your eyes be single so that your whole body will be full of light. Hallelujah. So focus on the hope of his glory. The glorious inheritance of the saints. And if you stick around for that long, I will show you many of these inheritance in the saints. And in the exceeding greatness of his power. And he told us what, what, where we can find that power. He said the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. It's the same power. He, the power he wants you to know is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And what does that power do in us today? The Bible tells us the power is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that power saves people from destruction. It saves people from sin. It saves people from death. Breaks people out of captivity. Bondages. But now, we are not satisfied with those things. You will not carry yourself back into a strange land to be singing the Lord's song. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? But that's what we are doing. For the most part. Because we are not comfortable, we are not contented with the, 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 the ambience of the church world. The music is not, it's not, it's not powerful enough. So you go and import Sophisticated secular. You know that you yeah, are, you know now. <laughs> you want to sanctify the secular. Yes. Can you imagine? You, you are talking, you know, in the church of Jesus Christ, when God is the, is the focus of worship, in the, in the church of Jesus Christ, you have become so carnal. I know it's not usual. We cannot do that. You, can, you cannot do that in the church of Jesus Christ. You now bring all the legwork in the church. All the legwork. That's elegu and elegu loman, your masculine dancers. That's what they used to do. You want to be dancing batatu in the church. Do you, have you forgotten the days of choreography? Thank God those days are gone. In some places they are still doing it, I know, but, ah, but it's, it's lost its mainstream effect. You now take all these small, small girls, we wear them gloves and socks, long ones. <laughs> Let's come back to the basics. Not the word of God. Let's go back to Bible B competitions. Memory, that's why I brought memory verse to adult. You will read. Why will you not read? You will read. It is because we started, we started taking out the good things and replacing them with the bad ones. Entertainment that we brought from the world. We cannot even, even if you want to do entertainment, you cannot even create your own entertainment. You will now take a secular song. You will now remix it. Put some, you change the wordings. Put some and then come and sing it. But it still carries the spirit and the vibe of the original song. Or what, do you consider what is the inspiration behind the song? Have you considered it? What is because what inspires these secular musicians to sing? The kind of things they sing. Yeah, but that's what they say. But do you believe them? 
Some of them is their inspiration, not drugs. Some of their songs, don't you see, women? Somebody sings, you two find past my me, what the hell? And you are dancing it too. Comparing you to mommy water, are you mommy water? And you are dancing, you are happy. You are happy. And you even know. Something you should be ashamed of. Somebody is calling you mommy water. No. No. It should never be. It should never be. On our wedding day, eh? My wife selected songs that the DJ must play. He said, What kind of people are this one? No, you cannot just play anything here. I will select songs for you. Yes. We need to be that deliberate. So that we can impose our life in Christ on our daily living. Do you see it here? He prayed for them that they will know God. So, is it a good thing for us to adopt praying like this so that we can entrench our knowledge of God? Eh? Even though he did not instruct us to pray, is it okay to pray this? What will be the effect that we will increase in the knowledge of God? Do you see it? Do you see it? Go to chapter 3 of the same book. Which is the one I gave you for last week. From verse 14. Ephesians 3 verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. What is he doing again? Praying. Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he will grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Can you see that? That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Verse 20, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. He wants God to fortify you. That's what's strengthened. Might, power. To fortify you with his power. By his spirit. He says, in your inner man. In your inner man. That man inside. Not this carcass. Not this body. Because, you see, the Bible says the, the body without the spirit is dead. So, in your spirit, it says he wants God to fortify you with power by his spirit, in your spirit. He wants you to be strong inside. And when you are strong inside, you will yield to knowledge of God. That's why he says that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith. That ye being rooted, can you see? Rooted and grounded in love. In the love of who? Love of God. You see that now? It says to know. You will know. You are rooted and grounded in love. You will know the love of Christ. Can you see? You know. Do you see? Your Christianity has expression in knowledge. What do you know? And your relationship with God is as good as how much you know. How much of God do you know? Hallelujah. Colossians, Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. If you have been coming to church, if you have been meeting our prayers, you know this is what we pray every day, every Sunday, right? In fact, every service, not just every Sunday. All right, verse 9. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ, being filled with fruit of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. What, did he, what, what does he want God to do in their lives? That their love for who? Their love for God. We are bound more and more. He says in knowledge. So how do you know someone that loves God? You see, it starts with how much of knowledge of God he has. So now, after this meeting, with all these things that I have taught you, what should be the fruit of it? That you will love God more. Do you see that now? The fruit of knowledge, the fruit of the knowledge of God is to love God more. 
the fruit of your knowledge of God is that you will love God more. You will love Him. And when you love Him, it will influence your judgments. Are you following? It will influence what? Your judgments. Look at verse 10. It says that you will approve the things that are excellent. Approve. You will only do nice things. Things that are pleasing to God. Look at the next one. And be sincere. And without offense to the day of Christ. No offense in your life. Not to God, not to men. Your work with God is perfect. Because you are working with the consciousness of the love of God. Hallelujah. Then in Lewin, it says, you are filled with the fruit of righteousness. Look at that. You see, that, that's what the Bible calls good works. You begin to do, you, you just go out pleasing God. Because you love him. And wh why do you love him? You now know more about him. So you love him. And when you love him, you do the things he commands. By this shall all men know that you are my disciple. You love one another. So that you love one another, we love one another, we don't treat each other badly. It's because what? We know him. Do you see that now? Alright. Colossians chapter 1 verse 9. Let me finish this once. Colossians 1 verse 9. For this cause also, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Can you see that now? So since the day we heard of your faith, we do not cease to pray for you and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will. Can you see that now? We were praying for you that you will be filled with the knowledge of God's will. You will know what God wants. And then you will walk worthy of the Lord. Of course, when you know what God wants, what is the next thing? You walk in it. And when you walk in it, you are pleasing, God to, you are pleasing to God. Do you see that now? That's why Jesus, because he knew that his mandate was to come into the world and die for sinners. He said, oh, Father, you can make this cup pass over me. Then he says, nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Because he surrendered to the will of the, of the Father. Do you see that now? Anyone? Anymore? First Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. You can write that in your notes. We read that every service, right? That's what I start with. Yeah? First of all, supplications, giving, giving of thanks, supplications, prayer, and intercessions be made for all men. Verse 2. For kings, for those who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Verse 4. Who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's First Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. Now finally, Second Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 1 and 2 Pray for us, yes that the word of the Lord may have free course, yes and be glorified even as it is with you, okay And wicked men, for all men have not faith. I, I think I mischaracterized this. This should have been with um, instructions on what we pray, specific issues to pray about. I'll send you the other ones in our, on our WhatsApp group. Okay? Because there are other prayers Paul prayed. But these are the ones I selected. Now, if you want to be a, a good Christian, you should pray like this for yourself every time. The way Paul prayed, you should do it every time. Every time. Pray. 
Every time. Pray like this for yourself. Every single time. Do it. And when, you see, coming to church like this, live on living, it should draw your heart to God more. If you are living and you're like, man, ah, with what pastor said this today, eh, this week, I'll be bowling. Ah, I will make money. Ah, money, even money will know that I, 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 somebody, somebody entered town. You should check. Maybe you did not come to church. It wasn't me you listened to. When you are living, what will be on your mind? Right. God in Christ. That, ah, Father, I will serve you more. This week, I'm going to do more praying. By the supply of your spirit, I will pray more. I will devote more time to praying. I will not be lazy. I rebuke the spirit of laziness. You know, you are, you are encouraging yourself that I, 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 my, my work with you will be more profitable this week. That is what God is interested in. All right? That money, with or without God, people are making money. Eh? Uh-huh. So, don't, don't confuse yourself when you did not pray. Did God not bring things your way? Eh? Do you do you know do you, yes do you know that the top the top richest people in the world are not Christians the top ones of course there are Christians that are also very rich they are billionaires okay and I put it to you that it is not necessarily because they are Christians the Bible says the diligent and shall bear rule if the diligent and will bear rule what should you be diligent. And there are other factors that influences well too. I hope you know. Location is one of it. Your background will contribute to it. Because if you meet money at all, you have a foundation to build on. Don't you think so? But there are some people, they don't meet anything. They have to fight their way to it. You will fight your way to the top. Yes. You are... St- <laughs> And then sometimes you also need network, a good network around you. And if you don't have that network, you will struggle. For instance, I, I was doing, I, I mean, I was a graduate, I was a chartered accountant, but I was not, I, the job I was doing, I was not well paid. And one day, I, I heard of this uncle, I'm just saying this by the way, I, I, I met this uncle of mine, I, I heard of him, I've always heard of him. So this day, I said, ah, he works here. I heard he works here. I, I, I pass by his office every day I'm going to work. So I just thought, today, I'll visit him. So I stopped by at his office to greet him. So when I got there, I, say, I said his name at the reception. And I saw the way the atmosphere changed. You know, you know, there was a kind of shudder among the people at the reception. So I thought to myself, this person must be a big man. I don't know who... How big he was. I just thought, oh, he's my uncle. Yeah. And then, you know, time they told me to go to his office. It was when I got to his office, I now saw the tag at the door. <laughs> ED. <laughs> ah, so I just realized that, oh, I am coming to a big man. When I got inside, I had, I had Dobale. You know what they call Dobale? <laughs> I had Dobale. Of course, there was an elderly man. So I, I greeted him. And he said, oh, you are Femi. You know, my mom... Is, is his aunt. So he's my uncle. So, so he says, Oh, you're family, the chartered accountant. We never met. We've never met. This was the wow. first time we are meeting for the very first time. Wow. He, he says, You're a chartered accountant. I just took his phone. I started calling people. I did not say anything. He picked his phone. I started calling people. He called one. He said he was in France. I said, Okay, okay, okay. When you come back, he called another one. One allergy. The allergy said he was not in Lagos, something like that. Then he called another one. That one said he was in his office. He said, okay, that I will 
I will, I will send someone to you. And he finished the call. He wrote a note on his card. I did not say anything. No. All this why I did not say anything. I did not solicit for a job. I did not say anything. I just greeted him. I, it's my uncle. I'm seeing him for the very first time. So he wrote a note. And he gave it to me. And he said, how are you? He just talked generally. You know, rich men, they don't talk too much. When you're talking to small boys. <laughs> he didn't say too much. He just gave me the note. And he just greeted me generally. How are you? Your mommy and all that. He greeted me. I said, okay. And then he, there was an emergency. He called some of his boys. They came in. Me, he gave me a seat. All his guys that came in, he, he did not offer anybody seats. They all stood and with their hands behind their back. Grown men. That's why sometimes when we don't appreciate the liberty we have before God when we come to church. I had a boss also in the bank. When she invites you into our office, oh, be a joko. grown men, I'm not talking, I'm, I'm grown men, family men. I was a boy, I was a bachelor when I was in the bank. Bachelor. When you get to church, you will sit down like this. You are doing anything goes in front of men. We cannot do anything goes. A man slumped. They, yeah. A man, a family man slumped in her presence. She didn't bat an eyelid. They just carried him out and they continued the meeting. Slumped. Yes, slumped. This was my office. I'm not telling you reporter's story. It, this was my office. So it helped me appreciate, you know, you know, how, how to carry yourself. How to carry yourself, how much more before God. But anyways, this man gave me the notes. And he gave me money. I don't remember how much he gave me. But it was, it was for my salary then it was material. Because I was, I was so happy. <laughs> and I took the money, put it in my pocket. And I said, bye-bye, sir. Um... I will call you. He gave me his card. So I call him. I'll call you, sir. Till tomorrow. This man does not pick his call. I'm telling you. You know big men now? That number that is on his card is the general number everybody calls. General number. So if he picks it, you are special. I said, bye-bye, sir. As I was leaving, he said, where are you going now? I said, I'm going to walk. He said, which walk? Go to that place. My mind was ringing like, ah, this is my job. <laughs> he said, go to that place. But the HR I had then was my friend, so I called him. I said, okay, no problem, I'll cover you. And I looked, I just picked that card, I looked at it. It was Ikeja, I was in Marina, Ikeja. I thought I was going to go all the way back. The end of the story was that I got another job. The salary was more than double of where I was. So sometimes you need the right people in your life. Don't mind this. You don't need people. God, why did God, even God orchestrate people and put them on your path? He puts people, people on your path. Now, the devil can also plant people on your path. That is why where your relationship with God will count. To be able to separate the wheat from the chaff. So I said all this to tell you that the, that's the reason I don't focus on wealth. Too. In the light of God, it is not important. Did you hear me? It's not. God is not interested in the money you have. And you are not going to impress him with how much money you have. What he wants, what he died for is your soul. So which one is important to him? Your life. Will you rise on your feet this morning? Lift up your hands to God. Spend the next 10 minutes praying. And you will speak to God that your love for him is entrenched. It grows. Your love for the Father abounds. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Lift up your voice and pray. Your love for the Father abounds. That you will walk. Walk with Him. 
in the beauty of his holiness you walk with him loving him walking in the counsel of his will serving him night and day doing all that matters to him doing all that matters to him gracious lord gracious lord that our love for you abounds in the name of the lord jesus christ that we do not replace gold with brass that from me by your grace quality worship is what I offer every day of my life that I offer you quality quality qualitative worship that I will walk with you on your own terms on your own terms that my love for you abounds in the name of the Lord Jesus oh father my love for you abounds that this knowledge of you by it I press more into the love of God I press more into the love of God I am brought into the knowledge the lo- into the knowledge of the love of Christ daily walking with sincerity without offense in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ That by your spirit, your work is going on in my life. Oh yes. Your work is going on in my life. Your work is going on in my life. Oh yes. Developing me into that total man. The fullness of Christ. Walking with you in the beauty of holiness. Serving you day and night with sincerity, solely focused on you, my body full of light in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. My body full of light that I am full of light in the name of Jesus, that my body is full of light. All the days of my life, I walk after you, following you, never to walk in darkness. Oh, I have the light of life because I have Christ in my life. I have the light of life. I do not walk in darkness in the name of the Lord Jesus. I do not walk in darkness. I know what to do. In my worship of you, in my service of you, I know what to do. In my walk with you, I know what to do. I know where to go. I know where to go. I know the relationships to keep. That enhances my walk with you. 
relationship that spurs me to more prayer, to more word, to study, more study of your word. Somebody still praying this morning? By the God opposed the head of Daniel. The power of God is working in you. Leading you to more and more influence of the Spirit. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The power of God working in you. Making you whole. Working in you that old Christian experience. That whole Christian experience is yours. By the supply of the Spirit of Jesus. The grace of our Lord. Mightily supplied. For an effective walk with Him. That in my consciousness. Everything of the flesh. Becomes shadow in the light of you. Everything that is of flesh. Becomes shadow in the light of you. That my walk with you becomes perfect. 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 Walking with you. Perfectly. Walking with you perfectly. Walking with you perfectly. Walking with you perfectly. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Walking with you perfectly. Walking with you perfectly. The power of God walking in me perfectly. The power of God walking in me perfectly. The power of God walking in me perfectly. That in my walk with fellow men, I walk harmoniously. As long as it depends on me. Because of my knowledge of the Father, I follow peace with all men. Living without rebuke in the midst of a corrupt and a perverse generation, I shine forth as light. I shine forth as light. I shine forth as light. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The knowledge of the Father fuel in my life. Fuel in my journey through life. In the name of Jesus. Influencing my speech. My actions. My inactions. Oh, glory, 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 glory. Your power is working in me. Thank you, Father, because your power is working in me. Thank you, Father, because your power is working in me. Thank you, Father, because your power is working in me. Glory to your holy name. Give the Father praise this morning. Say, thank you, Father, because your word is working in my life. Thank you, Father, because your work is work is going on in my life. Glory to his name, Father. Glory to your name, Father. Glory to your name, Father. We give you praise. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you because you are building in us your knowledge. And pouring in us love for you. Building us firmly into the image of Christ. The fullness of the, the measure of the fullness of Christ. Thank you, eternal Father. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. I thought everybody would say amen. Amen. Father, I thank you, Father. I thank you because you're good. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the knowledge of Christ that is impacted into our spirit. I will pray that our mind profits from this word and enhances our walk with you in the name of Jesus. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples when you love one another. And our walk in love 
is perpetrated in the name of Jesus. That we walk with the Father in the consciousness of his love. And we walk with fellow men loving one another in the name of Jesus. Demonstrating the influence of our Father and of his kingdom in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.